last couple of weeks, we've been, I've introduced kind of the, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit uh, in the first and second Great Awakening. So have you enjoyed your history lessons so far? <laughs> I, I, I believe the Lord personally spoke to me that one of the things that he was doing was actually prophesying what he wants to do again, that testifying of his goodness, testifying of the way he came before, that quite specifically, and the unprecedented outpouring of Holy Spirit that transformed a nation, and not just a nation, but the nation's plural, transformed a planet, you know, that what he did before, he'll do again. I really believe he's setting us up for that but he's looking for people who will partner in the place of prayer. Is it, it, do we bring in revival because it's sovereign move of God? God's going to do whatever God wants to do in his timing and there's nothing you can do about it. Or do you have a part? It's both. God is going to do whatever God wants to do in his perfect timing and he'll lean on you until you partner for his will to be done in the way he wants to see it done. But it requires both. And he's looking for a generation of people who will look back over the history and not whitewash it and lose the stuff that's there, but actually grab a hold of it by faith and to begin to declare it over a nation again. Would you do it again, God? Like we said, would you do it like Cain Ridge? Would you do it again like you did in the first great awakening and the second great awakening? Not just a happy, feel-good party in a church, but an unprecedented outpouring that transforms the destiny of a nation and corrects many wrongs and awakens us to truth and reality and awakens us to your will being done, that awakens us to evangelism, that awakens us to boldness, that awakens us to an eternal mindset and not just a day-to-day doing the grind and doing what we do, doing it, you know, but it awakens us to this reality that we are here for a purpose. God's looking for people who will wake up. And we've talked about how history proves out, as we've looked at the first and second great awakening over quite a good span of history, that history proves out that it was God who was moving, that these supernatural phenomena, these unusual signs and wonders, that it was God. Oh, why, why do we say it was God when there are other people that are out there who are saying, no, 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 any kind of manifestation like that, well, that's demonic. Why are we saying it's God? We're saying that because from our vantage point in history, we can see the tremendously good fruit. We can see that thousands, countless thousands, have been brought to Christ because of his unprecedented, that being the Holy Spirit's unprecedented outpouring on the people. What are encounters supposed to do? They transform us into the likeness of Christ. Another way you could say that is they draw us near to him. What do counterfeit signs and wonders do? They actually repel us. They cause separation. They they cause us to, to move away from Christ. As we look back over history, we can see that what these signs and wonders did was actually draw countless numbers of people into the presence of God, into relationship with God. And here's the greatest part. He's still doing it. What we see in history is that Holy Spirit didn't come on the day of Pentecost in a grandiose way and then never again. No, what we find out throughout history is that he can continue to come, that he desires to continue to come. And what I love about this is that God refuses to let us slide down the slippery slope to complacency and sin. He refuses as long as there are praying people in the earth, partners who are crying out, we need you, God. We can't do it without you, God. He refuses to allow us to slide down the slope. And what I have seen as I have gone through the history of the church and the history of America and revival as it relates to those things, what I've seen is this. God continues to come over and over again and corrects our slippery slide into sin. He continues to invade because out of his mercy... He's not going to allow us. 
He pours out his mercy over and over again and revival happens and a reset happens and the plumb line is extended before us again and the church lines up again with God's heart over and over again and people are saved again and the the destiny of cities and nations are transformed in the wake of that again and again and again because there are a people. There is always a remnant from the beginning of the foundation of America. There is always been a remnant of people who were saying, God, come. God, do it again. God, we can't do it on our own. We need you. And he has over and over again heeded that call and shown up in unprecedented ways. You know what that also means, though? See, every time God showed up, every time the Holy Spirit was poured out in revival in unprecedented ways, every time without fail, all of the gifts of the Spirit were also stirred up. So people would get healed and, and people would spontaneously speak in languages that they otherwise weren't taught from birth and didn't understand. And you understand, the gifts of the Holy Spirit showed up with the Holy Spirit every time. So what I'm getting at is this. History, if you choose to actually read it, proves out and authenticates the charismata. What does that mean? It means the gifts are continuing to go. You see it in history. You have to be intentionally ignorant to see something other and or blatantly and demonically deceived. How many of you know the God of this world tries to blind you? (laughs) You have to either remain intentionally ignorant because you don't want to have to change or you're deceived by the enemy. Because again, history shows with amazing fruit that God continues to operate over and over again in the same way as we saw in the book of Acts. How many are happy about that today? At least like 15, that's not bad. That's better than first service, we're getting there. We are getting there. Today I want to bring you into the 20th century because as much as I believe I've done a good job, I hope that you think that, of of showing you this precedent in history and and proving out that it's God. These manifestations, while the, the devil tries to do a counterfeit, that the majority of what was happening was God because the fruit was incredible. While I think I've done a pretty good job, Proving that out through the first and second great awakening, I I think I would do you a disservice not to also bring you into the revivals of the 20th century. Revivals that have impacted the course, the destiny of the planet, and the way that you and I do church, see life, interact with God. The relationship that I have with God right now today, I owe to the revivals of the 20th century. Ready? Ready? So in 1840, the Second Great Awakening began to come to a landing point. Just 20 years later, we have a little-known guy named Charles Darwin. Anybody ever heard of that guy? This is how I know you're not participating. (laughs) We're going to have to improve on that. Charles Darwin writes a book called On the Origin of Species. Now that book has had wide-sweeping impact on the planet Of course, predominantly, I will talk about America, of which I have more authority to speak into and more understanding, but it has had wide-sweeping impact. Just 20 years after the landing of the Second Great Awakening, Charles Darwin releases a book that begins to shift the way that we think, that began to shift us off of the Bible being the answer to life's questions. What's truth? We find it in the Word of God and the Scriptures. It began to challenge that, and it began to shift the source of where we were finding truth off of the Bible and onto science. Now, I want you to know this morning as I say that, that science is not in contradiction to the Bible Science and archaeology and mathematics for years and years and years of all of recorded history has only gone to continue to confirm what the Bible already says. Did you know the Bible says the world is round? Sorry, flat earthers. Read read your Bibles. 
It says it's round, right? What the Bible has already declared and what we know within those pages is just confirmed by science. Even things that they're like, oh, look, it's a contradiction. Give it a few years. They'll find out there's no contradiction at all. Science is a man-made thing. It's a discovery. It's a practice. Like medical science, right? Ever had a doctor get it wrong? I mean, I love doctors. God bless them. So thankful for them. But right, it's a practice, isn't it? We're just, it's man trying to discover how can we partner with nature? How can we learn these things? We're bound to get it wrong. But as we, as we continue to move forward, science has always validated what we have found in the scripture. But this moment in history began to create a little bit of a divergence. That brings us up to 1860. And you know, probably in the 1860s is when we had the great civil war. One of the nastiest, deadliest battles that we've ever seen because we were killing each other. It's a horrible travesty, but on the heels of that was the emancipation of slaves and a shift that our nation would undergo that is unbelievably extravagant. But what I need you to know this morning is that all along the way, our faithful God was meeting us. Did you know that in the middle of the Civil War, there was a revival that broke out that resulted in 300,000 servicemen giving their lives to Christ? Jesus was intervening. There was a remnant of people who were praying, oh God, why are we fighting amongst ourselves? Why why do we have these issues? Why can't there be peace? Father, bring peace. And in the midst of that, God broke it in an unprecedented way. 300,000 soldiers on both sides, the north and the south, giving their hearts to Christ. Can you just imagine with me for a second? We always look back to the book of Acts and it's exceptional, but we're talking a couple of thousand, 3,000 and 5,000, 300,000 people in a small period with the revival breaking in and the civil war. Come on. Jesus needs a clap on that. I mean, in the... On the heels of the Civil War, as I've already alluded to, the nation began to change uh, with with such a pace that uh, I can't imagine people even keeping up. I mean, understand, we we just came, like five seconds ago, we just came out of a, let's go and expand and, 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 and conquer the wild frontier on a horse with flint and steel and a backpack right? Like there's nothing anywhere. And all of a sudden we get just to the other side of the civil war and rapid advancement and crazy stuff happens that by the year 1900, you have Henry Ford creating his first automobile, gasoline powered automobile. And of course, you know that right on the heels of that, he creates the assembly line. He didn't create the car. He just took it. You understand, I'm not trying to say Henry was the guy, but he did transform the world as you know it through his assembly line. In 1900, we have uh, in, in, uh, the West was won. The West was settled in its entirety from east to west. There were, there were settlements everywhere. The great wild West and the expansion was successful. That effort was gone, 1900, right? Everything began to transform. The, the radio that you and I listen to in our cars, maybe every day or at home, that began to come online. That had been invented. Uh, the telephone had been invented, and the telephone had widespread use over the entire United States. You understand, like, we just came from flint and steel and a fire on the prairie to people on the telephones, on a grid that spanned the entire continental U.S. We're talking rapid expansion, rapid prosperity, a rapid shift that I just can't even get my mind around. The Transcontinental Railroad had boasted at this point in time 193,000 miles of laid track. They had five different successful uh, railroad platforms spanning literally across the entire United States. We went from walking and buggies and horses in the middle of nothing to to an incredible country like overnight. Can you imagine being alive at this time in history? Can you imagine, just for a second, I, I, I want you to see, this is at 1900, we've got Henry Ford, we've got the Wright brothers creating the first airplane all at the same time, and the United States <clears throat> has now risen to a world power, defeated Spain, their only opposing enemy, and is now an autonomous state, is an autonomous country that has risen in prosperity uh, to the place of significant international influence. In the midst of all of this, there were a remnant of people who were praying. Remember, I told you, throughout all of history and every revival, there were always somebody 
There was always somebody praying. There was a remnant praying. They were, they were stirring. They were, they were hungry for God to move again. And they were saying, come Holy Spirit. In this little country called Wales, on the other side of the pond, people were getting hungry. One of these was a guy you may know by the name of Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was crying out for revival, crying out for revival in his own heart. And God began to meet him in an uncharacteristic and an unprecedented way. He actually began to move into daily heavenly visitations from God. Listen out of his own words, his own accounts from Evan Roberts. One Friday night last spring when praying by my bedside before retiring, I was taken up to the great expanse. I believe he's referring to heaven. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul, remember? The Apostle Paul, he says, I went to the third heaven. I don't know whether I was in body or out of body. I don't know. I just went. I know I had this encounter with God. Evan Roberts, he's talking about a similar encounter. I was taken up into a great expanse without time or space. It was communion with God. Before this, I had a far off God. I was frightened that night, but never since. So great was my shivering that the bedrock. Now, we're, he says shivering. It's just a difference in language. Like We think of shivering like, oh, he must be cold. Get him a blanket. We're talking the kind of shivering that became, that became shakes that literally began to rock the bed. Remember the first and second great awakening? It seems we're beginning to see the exact same phenomena manifest here. So great was my shivering that it rocked the bed, and my brother, being awakened, took hold of me, thinking that I was ill. After that experience, I was awakened every night, a little after one o'clock. This was most strange for me, for through the years, I slept like a rock, and no disturbance in my bedroom would ever awaken me. From that hour, I was taken up into the divine fellowship for about four hours. Four hours, are you with me? What it was, I cannot tell you, except that it was divine. About five o'clock, I was again allowed to go back to sleep until about nine. And at this time, I was taken up into the same experience as earlier for hours of the morning until about 12 to one o'clock. This went on for three months. Three months. Can you imagine crying out to God for revival to come in your land and revival to come in your own heart and God meets you by waking you up every night at one o'clock in the morning for three months and whisks you away into a heavenly encounter where he begins to invest in your life and speak to you like he did the Apostle Paul. Remember the Apostle Paul? He said, I've got stuff that God told me that I can't even share with you. Can you imagine God answering your prayer like that? Well, I need you to know, he's no respecter of persons. <laughs> I think he's asking you to partner and to begin to cry out like Evan Roberts. Can you imagine? In one account, he says three or four months, <laughs> he had this encounter with God that absolutely changed everything. And in his own words, he says this. He says, he says this experience seemed to change all my very nature. Do you remember what we've talked about? What is the point of these encounters with God? What do they do? They transform us into the likeness of Christ. What was happening to Evan Roberts as he was awakened and brought into an encounter every night for three or four months? He was being transformed into the likeness of Christ. And in this encounter, he began to get this download from God where he knew in a deep place that God was about to move not only in his city, but across the world. This became what we know as the Welsh revival today. The Welsh revival. It's fascinating. The Welsh revival had such a tremendous transforming effect on the community that it was reported that they actually had to lay off police officers because there wasn't enough crime to support their jobs. We find ourselves in this great nation at a place where some are crying out, defund the police, defund the police. I I feel to remind you this morning that we can't legislate morality. What we, I don't believe we need to defund the police. Instead, what we need is a mighty outpouring of God's Spirit. 
Because when you get a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God on the planet, the planet begins to conform into his likeness. And police are naturally laid off. Why? Because there's no need for them. And the ones that are left are transformed such into the likeness of Christ that you'll want them around anyway. What we need is a mighty outpouring of God's Spirit again. Because the problems that we face in our nation aren't going to be fixed in Congress. They're not going to be fixed by your mayor. They can only be fixed by a move of God. We can go after it the hard way, try to change things the slow way, try to change the minds of the generations, or we can partner like those in history and invite God to come and to do what we cannot do. We need a move of God in this country. And with a move of God comes a transformed mind, a, a different way of interacting with people, a different way of thinking. Are you with me? Of this Welsh revival, some first-hand accounts of patrons this guy says, eternal issues were discussed freely and unashamedly, and above all, a sense of the presence and holiness of God pervaded every area of human experience. At home and in workshops and public houses, eternity seemed inescapably near and real. One pastor said, if one were asked to describe in a word the outstanding feature of those days, one would unhesitatingly reply, that it was a universal, inescapable sense of the presence of God. The Lord had come down. The sense of the Lord's presence was absolutely everywhere. It pervaded, nay, it created the spiritual atmosphere. One historian puts it like this. It was common in Evans' meetings for members in the congregation to suddenly fall on their knees and to pray aloud. Waves of joy and sorrow would flood the congregation Women fell to their knees and men laid in the aisles weeping and laughing and praying. All the while there was, a, there was no sermon and no instrument playing. You know, I often hear an accusation against revival, against charismatics, that it's all just emotionalism. Oh, that Corey Watson, he's, he's a professional. Boy, he knows just how to prick your heart strings. He gets you all stirred up into a whole frenzy. It's not Holy Spirit. It's just your emotions. So calm down. Now, what was recorded in these meetings in the Welsh Revival was there was no professional musician. There was no worship leader. If worship came forward, and by the way, it was one of the marks of the Welsh Revival, it came forward spontaneously. That people would just begin to sing together a cappella. They said it was like angels came into the room, and I think they probably did. Evan Roberts, like today we, we think of big figures and Bill Johnson and Randy Clark and all these big guys. And you know, Randy was instrumental in the Toronto thing that happened. And you know, we think of these big figures who we hold in esteem, and rightly so, as figures in history. But Evan Roberts often came into a meeting and he would go and sit down and just pray with the people. Sometimes he would get up, he would share a scripture, or it would admonish the people. Sometimes he would come in, he would say hi, and he'd go somewhere else entirely. And not everywhere that the Holy Spirit was visiting had his presence there at all. This was not something that was manufactured by the people. Uh, it's pretty hard to stick the emotionalism claim on this one when there was no great orator, no great musician. And in fact, they said when Evan Roberts did speak, it was unimpressive. How many of you are happy to hear that? Because now you feel like God can use you. Guess what? He can use you. <laughs> it said that this revival actually birthed 30 different other revivals across the world. So it wasn't something that was maintained to a church or to a city. It literally broke out across the entire planet. Well, one of those seems to be what we have referred to in history as the, Rizu the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles, California. Ever heard of it? 
So the Welsh revival breaks out. God moves in an unprecedented way. And within that revival are all of the characteristic marks. The, the gift of speaking in tongue, tongues being released. People being healed. People being touched and overwhelmed such that they would fall to the ground. And of course, the whole thing was started by Evan Roberts himself convulsing so badly at the presence of God that somebody thought his brother thought he was sick. All of the same manifestations that we've seen in previous history and everything that we saw in Azusa unfolded actually first in Wales. And would you believe that it was only three months after the close of the, revi- the Welsh revival that we see what is said here, and, and I quote, the same gracious work of the Spirit being poured out in Azusa Street in California. This is 1906. Azusa Street was led by a young African-American aspiring pastor by the name of William Seymour. (laughs) I love this story. William Seymour was actually born to slaves who were eventually emancipated in his childhood. Can you just imagine for a second with me? Put your mind in the mind of history just for a second. The man was born to slaves who eventually were emancipated, and in his lifetime, it was illegal for blacks and whites to be in the same room together. (laughs) And in the middle of this context, this young man who had been influenced by a Pentecostal preacher by the name of Charles Parham. This young man receives a call. It's interesting, actually. He, he was a part of Parham's seminary, but because it was illegal for African Americans and Caucasians to intermingle together, Parham wanted him to be there, but he set him out in the hallway. And he had to get the instruction through the open door because they couldn't mix together. And in spite of this kind of environment, politically over the land, all of those white seminary students raised money to send Seymour to Los Angeles, California to preach at his first post where he would be interviewed by a church that was looking for a pastor. <laughs> Interestingly, having been influenced by Parham, Parham was a Pentecostal preacher, and one of his primary points was that the baptism of the Holy Spirit resulted in speaking in tongues, right? And so, unfortunately, Seymour, I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately, let history prove it out, I guess, (laughs) But, but his first sermon out of the block as one who was looking to pastor this church was... Speaking in tongues is an evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know that I would have done that. I think I may have, you know, came in a little softer, you know, sitting around Jesus or something. <laughs> like, but this is what he decided to do, and he was met with a padlock on the door the next day. <laughs> uh, they were like, I knew. I don't think that's going to work out. And I want to take pause here to speak about what we were talking about just this morning already. Have you ever believed that you heard the word of the Lord of your life and over the direction that you were supposed to go. But when you went there, it seemed like all hell started being levied against you. The other thing is this. Like you went there and when you arrived, you were like, uh, this doesn't look like what I thought it was supposed to look like. Like, didn't you send me to L.A. to pastor this church? Like, that's what I felt like I heard. And yet he arrives and they padlock the door. Sorry. <laughs> not going to happen. We don't know what that crazy witchcraft is you're teaching on. It's not going to happen in this church. Somebody within the church says, no, I don't know. I, I think they were soft. I just felt God on that. And they opened up their home and it began a small prayer meeting. I want you just to picture this in your own mind. Imagine being a young seminary student. You don't have three nickels to your name and you travel all the way to California, in this case from Missouri, to arrive. And you're believing that you're going to be the senior pastor of a church. You're going to be able to do what you believe God's called you to do. You're probably going to get a, a paycheck to do it. Who pays me to be? This is my calling. This is a like, you know, and then you get relegated to a prayer meeting that nobody's attending in somebody's house and there's no paycheck. How many of you know you can't add a single hair to your head through worry? Trust me, I've tried to add a few. <laughs> Lord God, please, I need hair. I won't look the same. Yet somehow when we are faced with similar circumstances, often our go-to is worry. What we get from the story of William Seymour 
at the very minimum is that we can trust God. Will you trust God when everything seems to be against you? When everything seems to be the opposite of the word that you so clearly heard him speak to you, will you trust God or will you allow circumstances to discourage you? When Misty and I were on the mission field, we heard God expressly state, I'm sending you home to minister to your own people. 18 months later, we understood he was saying that we were going to be pastors. It was never on our radar before that. We flew home, we sold everything again. This is the second time now we've sold everything and walked away in our lives to arrive and to live with my in-laws. And if that wasn't painful enough, love you, just joking. If I wasn't live streaming, I'd say something different. Just joking, just joking. We arrived home to live with my in-laws and nine months of unemployment followed. I said, Lord, this isn't what I signed up for. Didn't you say? Yep, he said. But the pathway didn't look like what I thought it was going to look like, and we were getting pretty discouraged nine months later when literally nothing, I couldn't even get McDonald's to hire me. (laughs) Will you trust God when everything looks like it's resisting you and standing against you and causing you to question, did I even hear God in the first place? See, William Seymour, (laughs) called to be a pastor in California, was now in this small group in somebody's living room, but the good news is this, he was faithful. He was faithful. He was faithful to God, and he was faithful to his calling, and he continued to move forward, and he continued to do and to be faithful with what had been given him, and he continued to preach this message that he felt like he had from God. And all of a sudden, somebody got baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. How many of you know that's a pretty darn good day? William Seymour himself hadn't even had the experience yet. How many of you know the righteous live by faith? What does that mean? That means you believe it before you see it. Once they got one, well, then they began to come one after the other. The word got out that this small little bitty prayer meeting, that God was visiting them, that God was doing something extra supernatural, and people began to flood in all from around to come to see what is it that God's doing. See, they were hungry for a move of the Spirit. They were hungry for the inbreaking of God to come to bring transformation to their own hearts and to their cities, and this is the sweetest part. The very pastor who had padlocked the door (laughs) a few weeks before, arrives at the meeting herself being touched by the Holy Spirit, resulting in speaking in a language that she was not born in. (laughs) One more maligned, when we have an injustice, how many of you know vengeance is his, not ours? And I can take vengeance, I can do that, I can take it into my own hands and I can get bitter and I can get prideful at the injustices that I'm facing, at the things that are coming at me, you bet I can, and if I do, I have my reward. But if I can keep my pride down, I can stay humble, I can keep from bitterness, and I can trust God in the midst of those circumstances, how many know my God will vindicate me? Years ago, I worked for a bank. I was an account executive. I was actually hired in at a much lower position with the express agreement that after a certain amount of time, when the other position, the account exec position came open, I would be shifted into that position. That's the only reason I accepted the job, and i am be the first one to tell you, I think everybody ought to start in the basement. I have no problems with that, but when that position came open, they overlooked me quite specifically and strategically, and I was very upset about it. I stayed, I got humble, I trusted God. Months later, a position came open at the main branch of the, it was a credit union, so they had several branches all around the city, Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas, spread all over the place. I went to the main branch. After a period of months, I worked my way up to the top, to the top, was top three spot in salesmen. They, they, they gauged kind of what we were doing, they had statistics and all this. I did what they said I could never do because of the favor of God on my life and because I was willing to submit and trust him. And my branch manager, my boss, was in a meeting with all of the other branch bosses and he slides a piece of paper over to the one who overlooked me for the job. And he says, hey, uh, can you just read the name on number three spot there for the whole company? Sean Banson. He was like, in your face. 
<laughs> you should have hired him, but thank you. You know, and I'm going, come on. I didn't have to get nasty. I didn't, ha- you know, I didn't have to trade evil for evil. I just had to get humble and trust in my God. And he used even heathens to vindicate me. Like, you know how good it felt that day? I'm like, but you did what I couldn't do. Like, I couldn't do that. Thank you, Jesus, did that happen. That was awesome. You can go one of two ways. You can get evil. You can exchange evil for evil. You can get bitter. You know, or you can get humble. And trust in a God who will always work it for your good and for his glory. And you partner in the place of faith and prayer to call it in until your circumstances begin to line up with heaven. Is this making sense? This is one of the things that we can get from the story of William Seymour. Some of the patrons in the meeting, they described his, their experience in this way. The fire of God fell, and God sanctified me. The power of God went through me like thousands of needles, one guy said. Another person says, the power of God descended upon me, and I went down under it. He was slain in the spirit, as we would say today. I have no language to describe what took place, but it was wonderful. It seemed to me that my body had suddenly become porous, and that the current of electricity was being turned on me from all sides, and for two hours I lay under his mighty power. (laughs) Another one says, someone might be speaking and suddenly the spirit would fall upon the congregation. God himself would give the altar call. Men would fall all over the house like those slain in battle. Or they would rush to the altar and mass to seek after God. The scene often resembled a forest full of fallen trees. (laughs) All of the same phenomena that we have heard about in every revival under the sun. Many slot the Azusa Street Revival as the beginning of the Pentecostal and the charismatic movement. Uh, I agree with one historian in that it looked to me like it was actually started in Wales. It was actually started in Wales and rebirthed in Azusa. And we owe, church, (laughs) we owe everything to an African-American pastor in the midst of a climate that was so racially charged and so in opposition. Where legally, blacks and whites couldn't stay together in one room. We owe everything to a man who says, I'm not bowing to that. I'm serving my God. And because it was obedience, it didn't matter what color you were at Azusa. And at a place where racial tensions were through the roof and you couldn't be together in one place, black, white, Asia, people everywhere, rich, poor, shoulder to shoulder, piling in this place. (laughs) Because God was on the move. Because there were people who were faithful. What we need is another great awakening. Because when God shows up in an unprecedented way, people are transformed into his likeness. They begin to think like him and they begin to look out and instead of being separate and divisive and vindictive, we say, we are all God's children. We need God to break in in this nation. Will you pray with me? We can partner with the political spirit. We can try to legislate morality. Or you and I can get on our face. We can humble ourselves and ask God to pour out forgiveness on a broken nation. And declare with faith, would you do it again, God? Would you do it again, God? Would you steer us a different direction again? We can have a little bit of impact. But God can transform this place. Amen. Amen. Father, we, we invite you to do it. We need you, God. We need you. We need a mighty outpouring. We need you to dissolve tensions in our nation. We need you to expose evil plots, political spirits, and Jezebelic stuff. We, just, we need you, God. We don't see it. You see it. We're asking, would you come? Would you heal our land, God?
Would you, would you touch us again? Would you do it again like you did at Cane Ridge? Would you do it again like you did at Azusa? We're desperate for you, God. I don't even know that we can do it on our own because people are desperately wicked. We need you, God. We need a mighty outpouring. And we're asking, do it again. In Jesus' name, amen.